and um, thank you very much for all coming for you. It's uh, great to see people here at all. First of all, came here, uh, nobody came. And so I said, oh, that's, that's right, we can all go home. And then um, no, they said, you've got to give your talk, even though there's nobody here. So they went and got a few people on the street. And it worked out very well. So um, thank you very much. I, this is not a, 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 an academic talk, but at least not very, uh, as you will soon realise. And it's not an awful lot to do with sustainable cities until we come to the end and perhaps the future. So this is at home with your microbes, new friends everywhere. And I thought uh, leaping into just talking about the microbiome would be a little bit difficult. It was difficult for me because I, I still don't really understand very much about this. And nor does anybody, in fact. But we are learning a lot more quite quickly. So we need to know a bit about what microbes are. Uh, they have a fantastic history. They're about 4 billion years old. Um, we're 200,000 years old. So we've got a lot of, uh, we're, we're not likely to survive. And of course they will. Um, how much is, uh, I'm going to mention briefly, if you were interested in that. Uh, we're very closely related to our microbes, and I'll talk about that. And then we need to see them, I think, much more as friends now. Clearly, many of them are terrorists as well. They kill us, and in the past they've killed us in huge numbers, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll give some specific examples, because my interest, as Philip has said, is really in asthma and allergy. Uh, and there are relationships between uh, these microbes and not only asthma and allergy, but now emerging many, many different diseases, as you will have heard on the radio and uh, is very much in the public eye. So this is uh, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, as you can see. They don't have a printed version anymore, it's all online, but they have lots of lovely pictures. So this is the whole history of life um, on the planet. That's about four billion years worth, uh, if you look down there. And so you go from bacteria, uh, just one thing that's quite important I'll say a little bit more about is the difference between bacteria and eukaryota. I'm not going to use a lot of fancy terms, mainly because I don't know many of them anyway. Um, but not mentioned in here, which I was quite surprised, are the cyanobacteria. These used to be called the blue-green algae. And they arose very early. They could take sunlight and convert it into energy for themselves and give out oxygen. So prior to those bugs, uh, there was the, the, it's thought that the concentration of oxygen was about 1% uh, on the planet. Clearly couldn't sustain any of the sort of life we have now. And over about a billion and a half years, they took that up to 21%, which is where it is today. And without that, uh, none of the rest of it would really be here. Um, now, uh, I don't believe in God. Uh, that's not important to the talk. Um, and so if you don't believe in God, you have to get... Uh, you, have, you have to sort of find ways that um, give you some sort of satisfaction. And one of the great satisfactions for me was learning that this is an oak tree, and it's an angiosperm. And it goes along this line here. It, it branched off quite early. Uh, I mean, there's billions of years in here, but you can see we're quite a long way. And we actually share 75% of our genes with oak trees. And I found that fantastically encouraging because what it means is that we're all, everything on the planet is related. And actually we share, we share genes with bacteria. Well, I'll say a bit more about that. But the fact that we're closely related genetically to oak trees, I think is uh, somehow quite pleasing. I'm not sure if anybody else does, but I find that quite pleasing. Now, we need to get an idea of size. Size is always important, despite what anybody says. Uh, and so this is a human head. And it's blown up uh, 1,200 times. And that is about the size of your average bacteria. They do vary quite a lot. Uh, these could be bacteria, but actually I don't think they are. It turns out, as um, and God must have organised this, even though I don't um, believe in him, but the smallest cell in the human repertoire is the sperm. And that's about how it would look on this hair blown up. And the largest cell uh, in the human repertoire is the ovum. And actually it's so big, you can see it with the naked eye in a dish, providing it's uh, staying properly. So, a huge variation in size. Uh, and so that's, that's just to compare those cells, so you get an idea of what we're talking about. But then, of course, um, nature goes down another whole scale. So, this is a transmission electron micrograph, which I've stolen from somewhere. I think it did say something about copyright, but I uh, haven't worried about that too much. There's our bacteria. This bacteria is now this. So it's blown up again to that size. And these are viruses. And of course, um, bacteria are plagued by viruses. And they have a very complex machinery 
that actually allows them to get rid of viruses in a, in a very appropriate way. And in fact, that machinery is now being harnessed uh, by mankind to uh, interfere with genomes. I'm not going to say much about that, maybe because I don't understand it, but you can see that these viruses are very clever. They're actually going down, they've got little bits going down here into the bacterium, and of course they, they get into the bacterium and they take over the DNA machinery. They divide in the bacteria and then come out. So, uh, that's just to give an idea of scale. Now, don't worry about the details here. This is basically those cells that I was talking about. These are the cells that make up all life uh, that isn't bacteria, essentially. And these are the sort of cells that make up all plant life. And the interesting thing is that the thing that differentiates them is that in bacteria, everything is just in one big pot. So it's relatively disorganized inside a bacteria. The, the DNA is just sitting there in the middle in a sort of goo, and all the machinery that makes it work, it's all just mixed in in one big bowl. But in order to get more organized and, to, and for cells to specialize in the way that they had to, cells have actually developed whole little factories within Factory. So there's all sorts of machinery in here that does very specific things. But the really exciting thing, because I said you know we're closely related to oak trees, actually, it is now thought that the main energy producing apparatus in a cell, these are these cells of all living things, or in plants, are actually bacteria. They're ancient bacteria that entered, they were modified, they entered these cells and allowed them to work. So we are our bacteria, really, in many ways, if you go back uh, far enough. And exactly the same hap thing happened in the plant world. So the chloroplasts, and these, of course, contain DNA. So they actually have a machinery of themselves uh, in relation to reproduction. So in order for these cells to become as complicated as they have, they've actually incorporated bacteria into them. So um, I'm just building up a picture that we really, you know, bacteria really are us. So, just a bit of history, because I think that's always very important. Um, if you don't know anything about the history, uh, you might repeat the problems. Actually, I don't think that's terribly true, but I find the history very interesting. So, bugs were first seen in 1676 by Lumen Hook. He built his own microscope, and he looked down it, and he saw these little animalcules. Uh, didn't go much further, he drew them. Um, and for about 100 years, nothing more was done. Nobody could produce a microscope, actually, that was powerful enough to see them. He was, a, he was a brilliant microscope maker, and it was a hundred years before anybody cottoned on. Bacteria, uh, the name was given, it's Latin for staff or cane in 1828. Uh, by the mid-1800s, Louis Pasteur um, showed in a series of elegant studies that actually microbes are responsible for fermentation. And at the end, uh, just remind me to uh, tell you the story about Pasteur and champagne, if there are no questions or if we're waiting for questions, it's quite a fun story. Now, Robert Koch, um, he was responsible for showing that these bugs actually cause disease. And he did that by taking the bugs, giving them to um, animals or even to humans, and showing that they develop the disease. Um, so he was the first person to really nail that down. And then these two people, Eli Metchnikoff and Paul Ehrlich, I'm going to say a little bit more about. Eli Metchnikoff and Paul Ehrlich shared the 1908 uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, they were first awarded in 1901 uh, for um, phagocytosis. Uh, you know, that's where cells engulf bacteria uh, and destroy them. And Paul Ehrlich for his work on magic bullets. So human beings like uh, to weigh things and measure things. And of course, we, we get into these silly exercises, and they are silly. Uh, and I've no idea whether they're even true. Uh, but even if they're approximately right, it's interesting. So this is quite easy to calculate. The wet weight, and don't forget we're 69% water, so the dry weight of humans would be 69% less. But all humans on the planet weigh around 350 million tons. That's about 7,000 titanics. Now ants come in at about 300 million tons, and termites at about 445 million tons. So although there's a lot of us, uh, we're not the most... Um, by weight, by wet weight, the numerous on the planet. But here's the number that, that people have come up with for the dry weight, because bacteria, of course, are mainly water as well. But the dry weight of bacteria on the planet is thought to be between, between 350 and 500 billion tons. So there are a thousand times more by 
wait. <coughs> now, of course, these are estimates. They might, and people will challenge them. Nobody's ever going to know exactly what this is. But even if they're wrong by a thousandfold, there's an awful lot of them on the planet. <coughs> now, just to say a, two, a bit about these two. So, they shared the Nobel Prize. Paul Ehrlich uh, was working with um, dyes and chemicals. He, he knew people in the chemical industry. He came up with this idea of the magic bullet, that you could find a chemical, go in, kill a bacteria, and people who were dying of infectious disease, uh, providing it didn't kill the person, some of them of course did, the early ones, the, uh, the chemical that killed the people. And Eli Mechnikov, uh, who discovered, phag discovered phagocytosis, um, actually uh, then got a bit carried away after his Nobel Prize and got into lactobacilli. These are the bugs that specifically ferment milk to yogurt. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So the magic bullet, uh, people often think, if you're outside science, that actually, you know, scientists sit there and do clever things and work out what's the best thing to do. Nine times out of ten, they don't. It's purely serendipity that things arise. And this was serendipitous in that he was working with chemical dyes. He was working with, um, uh, he knew people in the dyeing industry, and, and this was a huge chemical industry, particularly in Germany, and he was interested in how you could use dyes to stain bacteria. And then he said, well, if they stain bacteria, maybe they kill them as well. And that's how the whole concept of magic bullets developed. It developed from the dye-making industry and the idea that these dyes would enter the bacteria. They knew they entered them because they stained them and could kill them. Now, of course, uh, I've been saying the bugs are good. They're also uh, historically pretty terrible. We've had dreadful infectious um, um, diseases. So at, at times in history, one in three children never reached the age of five. That was almost entirely because of infectious disease. Purple fever, which killed many, many mothers uh, historically. This, of course, was mainly iatrogenic. Most mothers were infected by the people that were looking after them, particularly if they were doctors. They did much better if they were looked after by midwives, and the mothers knew this. Uh, they didn't know at the time what the problem was. And then, of course, 25% odd of Europe was wiped out in various waves of the plague, and TB is still with us, uh, typhoid, cholera. So specific bugs have caused us a terrible problem. And uh, many people have argued that um, sanitation is really what transformed human health publicly, but personally, Antibiotic therapy uh, undoubtedly transformed it. And when I was a medical student, and still very much now, you know, the concept was that microbes cause disease and must be eradicated. And I've shown you that actually that's impossible um, because they are much more prolific and nothing that we e will ever do uh, will eradicate them, and nor would that be a good idea. But why I say that we need to, even the nasty ones, we need to maintain them as friends is because not only have they done lots of things for us, they've actually provided the vast majority of chemicals that we use in terms of antibiotics to cure uh, infectious disease. Virtually all of them, uh, although the molecules have been changed, virtually all of them come from other bacteria or other fungi. So in the end, they've actually been uh, responsible for uh, the development of antibiotics because in the soup in which they live, they're continually warring with each other, and the chemicals they produce kill other bacteria that they don't want around. And by harnessing those chemicals, we have had a whole range of antibiotics. And this is Alexander Fleming. Uh, he was a good microbiologist, um, but not terribly careful. And you'll know the story, he went away on holiday, he left the tops off his plates, um, came back from holiday and found that uh, they'd been colonised by penicillin, by penicillin mould that had come in through the window. Uh, instead of throwing them out, uh, he actually looked at them closely and noticed that wherever there was the penicillin mould, there was a ring where there were no bacteria. And that was his great insight, that actually penicillin was doing something to kill um, bacteria. But again, purely serendipitous. He hadn't left the tops off his plates. It might have been a long time before people actually got onto them. So, um, just, I mentioned the terrorist element of um, uh, bacteria, and of course we're now facing, as you will all know, this situation where our antibiotic therapy is running out, mainly because there's no money in it for the pharmaceutical companies to produce it. Uh, and if we're not careful, we are going to be in a situation where, as people were prior to the antibiotic era, where you know you, you prick your finger on a Monday, you have a fever on a Tuesday, and you're dead 
on Wednesday. That was a sort of classic thing that happened. And so people are becoming incredibly worried about this, and there's a lot of effort going in to try and fix it. Now, um, I'll say a little bit about uh, Eli Mechnikov. Maybe I'll, I'll move on quickly. I, 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 there's some slides I'll miss. Very briefly, I'll tell you his story. Uh, after his Nobel Prize, he went a bit mad, and he decided that the main problem in life was having a colon filled with dreadful bacteria. And he, was suggest he even suggested to people they should have total colectomies uh, to get rid of all the bugs in their bowel. Of course, in those days, that would have been a death sentence, so it was a pretty silly idea. But he did find a group of people living in Eastern Europe in the mountains who appeared to live very long lives and lived in, almost entirely on a diet of fermented milk. And so he became convinced that fermented milk was the answer to a long life and was largely responsible for introducing the concept that came from um, the Indian subcontinent originally and had come across the Middle East uh, of fermented milk to the European diet. I'm going to go through these a bit quickly because I'm going to run out of time. No, we're not. Okay, well, no, well, we can come back to them. We can come back. Don't worry. So, friends versus terror, just, just to summarize where we've got to. So, Microbes are found on every corner of the planet. They've been found in places that, where the temperature is greater than boiling point, so they can survive heat. They've been found kilometers down on the ground. They've been found, of course, by the sea vents where they live on sulfur. There isn't a place on the planet that does not have microbes in it. I've already told you that estimates suggest they're about a thousand times more greater than the mass, the dry mass of bacteria, than all the humans on Earth. So clearly, they can lay claim in terms of mass to only the planet. And we actually have bacterial structures incorporated into the machinery of all of our cells, and they wouldn't work without that. So we are very closely related to these organisms historically. And of course, they've been here a long time, uh, about four billion years. And this is interesting because it means life started very early because we think the planet's about 4.7 billion years old. Uh, within um, 0.7 of a billion years, there were bacteria on the planet, which suggests that there will be trillions of planets around the world in which this simple form of life uh, has developed, because it's, it's, it, it happened very quickly. Now, of course, we've been around 200,000 years in our current format, about uh, 1 20 thousandths of the time the bacteria have been here. Uh, we're not likely to uh, go anything like as long as they have, and they'll be here long after we and others have gone. Civilization has been about 6,000 years, if, uh, well, what we call civilization, you have to wonder, uh, sometimes currently. Uh, and then we've been industrial for about 0.2 uh, thousand years, and of course in that time we've done a huge amount of damage to the planet that we live on, and we're continuing to do that damage, and the chances are we, we won't do very much about it either. Um, and of course, uh, it's responsible, these organisms are responsible for bread, mainly, certainly for wine and yogurt and cheese. But more importantly, they are responsible for the transformation of health in relation to infectious disease because they virtually all come from these bacteria. And now, of course, we can change their genetic machinery to make anything we like. And one of the first molecules to be made by bacteria was insulin. So most insulin now is produced not, doesn't come from pigs, it comes from bacteria. So you put the gene in, you can put a gene in for anything, and the organisms will happily grow away and produce whatever, you, whatever gene you put in, they'll make it for you. And so most insulin now is made by uh, bacteria. So they really are our friends. Now, now I can get on to microbiomes now. Uh, so the ones we're most interested in at the moment are the gut, because we have an awful lot of bugs in there. We know, we've known for a long time that we have a microbiome on our skin, this bacteria that live in sync uh, with our skin. But people have been very surprised to find that right down in the bottom of your lungs are bacteria, in the placenta, a place that we thought was completely sterile, you can find bugs. You can find them in breast milk. And the reason that we know this now, and the reason there's so much interest, is because we now have tools that allow us to, you couldn't grow most of these bacteria on a plate, which is a classic way of finding them, but you can find them because if you know there are a few sequences of DNA that are unique to them, all you have to do is look for that sequence of DNA and you know those bacteria are there. So this technology has completely transformed our ability to find bugs and also 
When you find specific genes <coughs> that you know are responsible for doing things, you can actually tell what the bugs are doing. You can tell what chemicals they make. And literally, this sort of thing can be done now in, sequ in sequencing machines that allow you to do thousands of these um, in, in a few hours. <coughs> then people became interested in the idea that, of course, the dust in our homes is full of bugs. We've known they're important in the soil. And even the healthiest water, the sort of water that is perfectly good to drink, has about a million bugs per cubic centimetre. It's when it gets above that, or it gets specific, nasty uh, bugs, that we begin to worry about it. So, so even sterile water contains bacteria. Now, uh, just to give you an idea of... So people are even beginning to harness this already. Now, this is... Um, a prestigious medical journal, and it's from 2013, and it's people are doing this now all over the world. Duodenal infusion of donor feces for a current Clostridium difficile. This is a real terrorist, and this is an organism that gets into people's gut. Antibiotics end up not being able to eradicate it properly, and people end up with a nasty, ongoing, chronic um, diarrhea for which antibiotics don't really work anymore. And so a study was set up to, oh, before the Study. So, so the idea of transferring um, um, feces from one person to another has become quite popular. In America, uh, it's very popular. There's a website called The Power of Poop, and this is a do-it-yourself. Uh, this gives you all the um, equipment, tells you all the equipment you need to do your own fecal transplant. And it's mainly been for people who have this nasty, difficile infection and couldn't persuade um, the medical profession to do it for them. And this is what you need to do. So there's a really good example of a microbiome. So you take the feces, mash it up, get a tube, and stick it at the bottom. And for, um, for uh, that Clostridium difficile uh, infection, it has revolutionized treatment for these people uh, with about a sort of 90% plus success rate. So that's just one example of a very practical way in which the microbiome is proven useful. Now, the domestic microbiome, it turns out that these What's going on in your gut and your skin, and even in your lung, because we know there are bugs living there quite happily now, is influenced by your indoor environment, and your indoor environment is influenced by your locality. So people who are living in the country, bugs that are in the soil, find their way into the skin and into the gut. So somebody living in a city will have a different gut microbiome from somebody living uh, in the country. So we know that the environment uh, around a bat is important. If you keep animals at home, that's important. That changes the microbiota because, of course, all animals, even the cleanest, leave lots of fecal organisms all over the place, uh, and they get into your gut and onto your skin and can change your microbiome. We know that uh, what's interesting is it's not only the amount that's important, but how many different species you have has turned out to be really important. You need to have a huge variety of organisms. That is the sort of healthier situation. And that's probably because the more diversity you have, the more your uh, immune system responds to it. And then people have become interested not only in richness, but are there specific organisms that are much more important than others? So now, I'll say a little bit about that. If you live on a farm, you have a very different microbiota than if you live in town. And there are huge differences, of course, between the developed, the economically developed, and the economically developing world. Now, my um, interest is in asthma, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of uh, asthma um, very briefly, because it does have a relationship to the microbiome that's quite important, or, or may become quite important. So this is a sort of fairly simple view. These are house dust mites. We know they're important. Cats, dogs. These are pollens. These are cockroaches. These are moulds. And these are little rodents, mice in particular. And these, obviously, a lot of these allergens that come from them, these are chemicals that are shed um, by them, get into dust, get into your home. And for some people uh, in New Zealand, about 40% of the population, become what we call allergic. And we define that by doing a skin test. You put a small drop of cat under the skin, and in people who respond, they get a reaction like this, they get a little bubble, and then this red area around. That's somebody who is sensitized. Their, their molecular machinery has been set up to recognize this molecule instantly and mount a reaction to it. And that's what allergy is. And then, and that's about 40% of the New Zealand population will have that. Some of those then go on to get uh, allergy-associated diseases, like hay fever, asthma, 
and a part of eczema. So these are the sort of diseases that in some people this goes on and cause a problem. Over about the last decade, we've realized that even if you meet these, and you can't really get away from them, you're going to be exposed to this pretty much, whatever you do. But if you live on a farm, and you go regularly into the cow shed as an infant, or your mother goes in while you're pregnant, or you drink unpasteurized milk, this was a great surprise to people who, fir uh, who first found this, and it's been repeated all over the world. Uh, we've even found it um, here in New Zealand. People who drink unpasteurized milk get it. Or go regularly into cow sheds particularly, but, but live on farms, get a huge amount of protection. They, so about a um, 50% uh, reduction in the number of people who get allergic. And a similar, slightly higher number actually get don't get these diseases. So being brought up on a farm and going to the cow shed gives you a huge amount of protection against these diseases. And one example that we found just recently, this is from a study um, <coughs> that was being conducted by um, Chris and Wickens and ourselves, um, just very briefly. Um, we, found that we were looking at the effect of probiotics, and actually in this particular part of the study we didn't find any effect. But what we did find is that if an infant was given yogurt, and this is just basically the sort of timing. So any yoghurt less than six months, this is the frequency of consumption. Any yoghurt in six to 12 months, this is from birth. They got this huge amount of protection. And what this, these are odds ratios, you don't need to worry about that. What that means is that only 27% of the people who would have got it actually got eczema. And only 38% who would have been sensitized became sensitized. So just having yoghurt, which contains bacteria, actually seems to protect you in the first year of life, we don't know whether it continues, from developing allergic disease. And similarly, if, you, if, you, if a mother cleans a pacifier uh, in their own mouths and then puts it back in the baby's mouth, they also get protection from eczema and from ATP. So by sharing organisms from your mouth, something that I think probably Plunkett says you shouldn't do, but people do do it, Again, they get a huge amount of protection from developing eczema or this skin-positive uh, atopic reaction. Now, <clears throat> this is um, only three minutes to go. We're, I'm getting on to a bit about the environment. So, we've known for a long time that the more allergens you're exposed to, the more likely you are to become sensitized. And then, a couple of years ago, this study came out from the US uh, in, uh, from a cohort that's following a bunch of children forward to see what happens. And what they found was that actually the story isn't nearly as straightforward. That it isn't just allergens that you meet that give you these diseases. It's really a complex relationship between bits of cat and bits of house dust mite and the bacterial environment in which you find yourself. And in this very nice study, and it looks complicated, and I'll take you through it, um, what they found, so they've divided the children uh, don't worry about the two groups, uh, particularly, these are two different uh, groups. This is all bugs, and then bugs that are thought to be specifically important. But they divided them into four groups. Children who developed neither wheezing or the sensitization I've shown you. But children who just had wheezing but weren't allergic. Children who uh, uh, had the sensitization but didn't have any disease. And then children who had both. And the colors represent this situation. So the red is a high load of bugs and a high load of allergens. The blue is high bugs, low allergens. The green is low bugs, high allergens. And the purple is low bugs, not many bugs in the house, nice clean house, and not many allergens either. And then just to put, make this more clear, taking out the middle bits, what it shows is that if you have a lot of bugs and a lot of diversity of bugs and a lot of allergens, you're actually very unlikely to get um, both wheezing and ATP. You're very unlikely to develop asthma. And in fact, for these specific taxa, no one in that high group, high bugs, high allergens, developed asthma and allergy. So the interaction between bugs and allergens seems to be hugely important. Whereas in the purple, so this would be the clean modern home, um, lots of things to kill bugs, low bacterial environment, uh, keep, keep the animals away, keep the dust away, low allergens, they had the highest rates. So if you have low bugs and low allergy, you're much more likely to develop allergic asthma. 
And so that's been a real um, sort of insight. And it's led to people going off and, and starting to look at communities that are very different. So these are the Amish. And the study came out last year, actually no, earlier this year, uh, comparing asthma amongst the Amish and the Mennonites. Now, Amish are a group of Mennonites. They're actually exactly the same genetically. So uh, they come from the same part of Germany, historically, and you cannot distinguish them. If you look at their DNA profiles, they look exactly the same. Amish live much more traditionally. They don't use motors. They do traditional forms of farming. Uh, they don't watch television. The Mennonites, uh, not all, but many of them, actually have embraced modern farming techniques. They've been very successful farmers. They do watch television. They do drive cars. They live much as... Uh, these are, are groups in America that have been studied. They live much as Americans. And it turns out that the Amish have almost no asthma or allergic disease. And the Mennonites, identical genetic uh, environment, have as much asthma and allergy as everybody else. So, my idea, and I, it's no more than an idea at the moment, is to create Amish light here in London. So this is Back to the Future. Um, so this is trials of domestic. So you, you do diet as well, biomic interventions in pregnancy in the first year of life. The idea is uh, that we would involve the zoo, we'd have antenatal classes in the zoo, and we'd have very regular visits of both mother and her infant after. But they would, they, these would be done in amongst the animals. Uh, I've talked to a few mothers, they say, well, you know, we think about it. Uh, but this really should be, this should be a coordinated um, sort of approach, ideally with developed and developing uh, countries involved, and rural and urban, to see what differences that makes. But the zoo would be incredibly excited, because they realise they'd have hundreds of people coming to their zoo on a very regular um, basis, and so they're thrilled um, with the idea. Whether we, can get it, whether we can get anybody to fund it, or uh, get anybody to approve it, is a different matter. So this would be the idea. This is what we need. This is back to the future. We need a sort of city farm environment uh, in cities. We need people to have pets, particular types of pets, and they need to cuddle them and be close to them a lot, especially the infants. Feather bedding, people have suggested that might be important. It's another biological exposure that might give protection. We're looking at that now. Internal, sorry, internal composting um, would be useful. Um, so people have shown that if you have an internal compost bin in your house, you actually have slightly less uh, asthma and allergy. And we need to get rid of most disinfectants. Um, these are ridiculous. You know, the idea that you need to disinfect everything is insane because you're never going to kill these organisms. And the more you, the more you tickle them up, the more you make them resistant to the sort of things uh, and potentially more dangerous. I've shown you that early yogurt is quite helpful. Uh, we need to think about allergenic foods. It turns out that the whole rise in food allergy is almost certainly atrogenic and has been caused by uh, doctors and health professionals suggesting that you don't uh, give your baby peanuts and allergic foods early on. Um, and that has probably driven the whole epidemic of food allergy. But that's another story. And then we need to do much less of this. So we need more dirt around the place. Uh, I think everyone will be pleased with that. Not good if you're a professional cleaner, but we're insanely troubled by it. Um, cleaning and, and things. And then uh, for the infant, they need to go to the farm regularly. They need to cuddle the pets. Uh, they need to eat yogurt early. Uh, they need to have saliva from their mother. Uh, pre mastication of food, perhaps, for those who don't want to use pacifiers. And a whole host of other things that will, um, that will be, uh, that will are likely to develop in relation to this sort of thing. So, just to finish, um, I hope I've convinced you that really uh, microbes do entirely will the earth. We're here just very temporarily, uh, and they will see us off without any doubt at all. Um, we need to reconnect with them. We need to think about our diet. Uh, we need to think about fermented foods. Uh, urban jungles clearly uh, have much less chance for interaction with these microbes, and we know that psychologically, um, uh, you know, just living in an urban jungle is not particularly helpful. We do need to contact the natural environment. But we do need to be careful. Uh, and as Nicola Machiavelli said, you need to keep your friends close and your enemies uh, even closer. So we do need to think about um, this association. So city farms, city fields, and get rid of the bleach. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Julian. We've got time for discussion. That was a great talk. So can you um, put your hand up and can you just say who you are, please? Yes, I'm Marion Grant. How do children who are brought up on farms and then suddenly transported to a boarding school, which is mostly city-based, is there any research on the adjustment that they've done? No, it's a very interesting question. Actually, it's not needed. Because it, turn, it turns question? out yeah, that... You, can you repeat the question? Oh, so the, the question is, uh, children who are brought up on farms but then go away to boarding school, uh, has any work been done on them? And actually, it's not required because it turns out that that effect of the farm only works during the first year of life. So they've actually studied children who were brought up on farms but didn't drink farm milk and didn't have anything to do with the cows and didn't go near the barns uh, and lived a bit away from the farm. And then there are a small number of children who actually did start to get exposed in later childhood. It has no effect at all. So the first year um, is absolutely critical. It's a window in which you can modify, it's thought, the infant's developing immune system. It's much too late if you, if you, you can't go back two or three. So by the time they go to school, everything will have been decided uh, in relation to that. But what was interesting in, in those studies, they've actually got a group of children whose mothers, these are mainly German farms, they're very small, the animals live underneath or nearby, and the mother often goes and um, uh, tends to the cows while she's pregnant. So actually, if the child never goes, if the mother goes um, and the child then leaves the farm, as soon as it's born, it gets quite a lot of protection from the mother's exposure to those um, microbes and that whole system, even without going itself. Not as much as if the baby goes as well, but they get, it gets a significant amount of protection just by having the mother live on the farm. Hi, my name's Matt. Um, similar question in a way. You mentioned probiotics a couple of times. Uh, yes. Uh, and specifically with infants and, and uh, pregnant mothers. Yes. Uh, there's a million products out there that are, you know, pushing probiotics for yes. adults and for various, you know, stomach issues and things yes. like that. Do you see any effectiveness in any of those, or is the jury still out, or is it a lot of kind of hoax claims that often? Yeah, a very good question. 99% uh, of, uh, of the sort of push for probiotics is, of course, complete nonsense. As most of the, uh, most of the, uh, you know, the idea that we need vitamins, for example, is a complete lunacy. Uh, if, you're e if you're eating a normal diet, you'll get all the vitamins you need. And of course, you eat the vitamins, pay a fortune to the drug companies, and then you pee them out as soon as you go to the toilet. So, absolutely insane. And that is true for most probiotics. It turns out, and this is really tricky, um, that it, we've done a study of a particular probiotic owned by Fonterra that actually, we gave it to babies for two years, uh, every day, and it actually halved the rate of eczema in those children over two years. It was a very specific uh, strain that they'd already done some work on, and it was purely by chance that it worked. When we went into this, we had no idea. We just went to Fonterra and said, do you have any bugs that we could have? And they said, oh, well, we've got two we've just been playing with. Um, why don't you try those? And by chance, one did nothing and another had this profound effect on eczema. So it's not even the species, it's the strain, because within a species there's lots of different strains that have slightly different chemical profiles, do different things. So it's very, very specific. And the idea that you um, just take a whole lot of um, probiotics uh, and it will necessarily work for your condition is wrong. But the evidence is mounting for very specific bacteria that do do specific things. And um, it's been found, for example, that children with severe asthma very early on are often deficient in particular bacteria, and we don't know yet, but it may be that replacing those very, very specific strains will have an effect. So I think, you know, um, there's not a lot of... Um, the one exception to that, though, is probably in the gut when people are... Uh, you know, antibiotic-associated diarrhoea, for example. It seems that a wide variety of, of probiotics do work for that. But mostly, it's very specific. And we're really at a very early stage. And, and I don't think for a minute that um, probiotics are a panacea for, uh, for anything. Very much. They're going to be very specific bugs that may do very specific things. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is, um, if you've got uh, so the, the, uh, the firstborn child in a family getting a problem, then the other children don't. Is that, that's the question. Oh, well, in my case, it's my middle child, over three, is, is 
Yeah. So, <laughs> so that is likely to be um, a, probably a genetic. Uh, I mean, a lot of um, it's not known really uh, why uh, why some children develop allergic disease and others don't. It's probably a mixture of the environment, although in that case the environment would be pretty much the same, and their genetic um, machinery, and even their epigenetic machinery. So genes can be modified very carefully by these epigenetic phenomena. So it's probably related to that. But of course, the whole basis of the hygiene hypothesis, uh, which came out about 20 years ago, was based on a study that looked at um, hay fever in 16-year-olds in Britain from a big cohort study. And what they found was that the first-born child in a family was much, much more likely to develop hay fever and allergies and allergic disease than the fourth-born child. And this is across a huge sort of population. And everybody who's repeated that virtually has found the same thing, found in New Zealand and found all over the world. And that's thought to be related to the fact that the first-born child sees a much uh, narrower repertoire of infectious diseases than a fourth-born child, because the fourth-born child has the other three coming into the home with viral infections and bugs and is exposed from a very early age to those bugs. And it, that combination uh, of receiving all those bugs very early on gives them a huge amount of protection. But, but as you see from that, it, you know, we're only just beginning to unravel this. It, it's almost certainly a very complicated sort of picture um, between the two. I just wanted to ask about um, vaginal birth and babies yes. picking up yes. microbiome or bacteria through going through the vagina and yeah. the mothers yep. picking up mothers. Yep. Very interesting. So a lot of work has been done on that. Um, and that it seems now very clear that the microbiome of an infant um, born by caesarean section in the early stages, probably for the first year of life, is incredibly different than a mother born by um, Vagina, and of course, the vagina has a lot of lactobacilli in it, which which protect against other infections because it creates a sort of acid environment, relatively acid environment. So uh, there are huge differences, and people have gone on, followed cohorts forward, and shown that actually children born by cesarean section do have an increased risk of certain allergic diseases and certain and other certain diseases as well. So there's no doubt there's a big difference. Um, but after about a year. Things uh, you, it's hard to tell there's much difference, but of course, that first year is probably critical. Um, it's a window in which the immune system of the infant is being consolidated, and so it probably makes a big difference. Now, this has led to um, some people, uh, and the first studies are just being done, sort of as we speak, of actually introducing vaginal bacteria to the baby you know, born by caesarean section early on. And there was a, at this meeting that um, uh, Philip mentioned that, uh, that I went to, um, somebody got up and talked about a study they'd done where they'd actually, uh, when the baby was born by cesarean section, they uh, took some vaginal secretions and exposed the baby to them orally. Um, and they did it as a sort of pilot study, a very small number, obviously with the parents' permission uh, and everything else. Well, it caused a huge outcry. Um, I mean, the medical profession went bananas in America and said, this is, what are you doing? This is a terrible thing to be doing. Think of the risks and the dangers of doing this. Um, and, you know, I, and I sat there um, thinking, well, you know, this is, like, this is like when I was back in medical school. I mean, this is insane. That baby would have traveled down that canal and swallowed goops of the, uh, of the vaginal secretions as it went down. Everybody was happy. The mother didn't have any infectious disease. They checked for that. Obviously, if the mother has a nasty vaginal infection, you wouldn't want to do it, but you'd want to treat that before the baby was born. But the medical profession went, went absolutely bananas, uh, which, which so is not, so it's a question not only of um, educating <laughs> everybody about bugs. The medical profession is way behind in terms of thinking about this. And, and, and that's understandable because uh, the focus has been, of course, on these bugs that cause so many problems. But um, we'll see many more studies like this. And I would think within a few years there will probably be a standard way of inoculating children with vaginal secretions um, after birth. Uh, yeah. Um, on the one hand, we're told that um, washing hands before handling food is probably the best way to reduce our chances of getting yes. um, influenza. 
No, it, it, that is a really good question, and this it is a balance, and so. There's no doubt that uh, influenza can be tra can survive on hands and on doorknobs and uh, on surfaces, and you know uh, um, studies that have been done, um, you know, in public health and work can show that you know, we stick our fingers in our noses, you know, ten times an hour on average. If you go and if you go and photograph people with video cameras, it's happening all the time. So there's no doubt you can transmit diseases like that, and there's no doubt that using the hand gels in the hospital setting has hugely reduced wound infections. And so in that environment, I think that is really um, good advice. But, uh, so, and, and, and I wouldn't, you know, it, it would be insane to not do it. It's transformed the health of people in hospital. But what, what people often don't realize is that actually, um, if you, you know, if you went and you went out into the middle of the street on a sunny day and stopped the cars and put your lunch down on the street, and started to eat it from the street, it would do you no harm. Well, you might get a bit of oil in it, that wouldn't be nice. Bacteriologically, it would do you no harm at all. If you did the same thing on the cleanest, cleanest, shiniest surface in the intensive care unit of Wellington Hospital, you might well get very sick. Because the problem is, in the hospital, the bugs are being exposed to huge amounts of uh, antibiotics. They, and their machinery, is, they're very clever, they can change. And so the nastiest bugs are actually in the doctor's waiting room and in hospitals. And actually, I think you know, the time is not far off when people, oh, in fact, it's already happened. You know, you go along to get a repeat prescription for your blood pressure, and you end up with a nasty dose of the flu, because half the people in the surgery have got flu, and it's very easily transmitted. So that's why I think you know, we do need to be careful, and there are situations in which um, uh, keeping hands clean uh, is very important. But in general, we, you know, the, the idea that we should be worrying too much about most bugs around us is incorrect. Tell us about champagne. Yes, thank you. Uh, good. Tell me if I was champagne. So Louis Pasteur. Who, now Louis Pasteur was a fantastic chap. He wasn't part of the medical profession, and so he he actually had to struggle uh, to get going because whatever he did, it would be wrong because the medical profession would say, "Well, he's not a doctor. He doesn't know what he's talking about." Of course, he transformed a lot of our understanding of um, bacteria. It turned out that, and many of you may know this story, it's an apocryphal story, but basically when Chardonnay wine goes off, it gets fizzy. And this used to happen in France amongst the, in the vineyards. And what the French did, as, as you'd expect, is they sent the off wine to Britain. Because they thought, well, the British don't know anything about wine, and they'll drink anything. <laughs> so they sent cases, as soon as the wine went off, they put it in cases and shipped it off. This is the mid-1800s to Britain, thinking, you know, that it's fine. And to their great surprise, the, the English came back and said, I don't, know what, I don't know what that wine is, but it's fantastic. Can we have some more? And the French thought, well, you know, these, these, it just shows you they know nothing. So they started making off wine that was fizzing and packing it off to Britain. Britain is still the largest importer of French champagne. They realized there's a huge market in this. So they started deliberately producing uh, fizzy wine by leaving the yeast in, putting in a bit more sugar. So then they discovered, of course, the bottles blew up. And there were quite a lot of deaths of the people down in the vineyard. One bottle would go, and they, didn't, they weren't using strengthened bottles then. The whole cellar would go up, killing anybody who was there. It's like a bomb, because one bottle would take all the rest. So it was Madame Clicquot, uh, who's, who still produced, the company still produces champagne, who asked Louis Pasteur, to, she said, look, we're selling all this off wine to the English. Uh, we're making a lot of money. We need to understand how to do this properly without killing all our vintners. So he came along and showed exactly how much sugar you needed to put in, how much yeast you needed to have left. He suggested you needed strengthened bottles and a proper cork, and you need to wire it on, and you won't have a problem. And of course, the French champagne industry never looked back. But it was Louis Pasteur who sorted that out. <laughs>